I have a question for you. How many organs are there in your body right now? Well, I asked Dr. Neha Sang, one who spoke earlier about this, and she said, well, it all depends on how we count organs. So I went and asked my most trusted source of information, Miss Google, and Miss Google told me there are 78 organs in the human body. I want to introduce you today to the 79th organ in your body, not created by nature, but created entirely by human beings. This little device right here. <laughs> now, does that shock you? Well, since most of you seem to be holding on to one right now, let me introduce you to the 79th organ. It has a skin because you touch it, it responds. It has ears, you speak to it, it seems to understand you. It has a voice, it talks back to you. It has eyes because you can hold it up and recognize its faces and objects. It has a brain because I know my smartphone is a lot smarter than I am. And it must have a spirit, a mind, some sort of consciousness. Otherwise, why else would we keep this so close to our heart? Sleep with it next to our bedside. And most importantly, spend most of the day with our phone lost deep in prayer. <laughs> But in all seriousness, there are 7 billion people that today form the global community, and 6 billion, 6 billion out of 7, have access to some sort of a mobile device. This is the most pervasive technology in human history. And what this means is more people have access to cell phones than have access to clean drinking water, or electricity. And I had a moment of epiphany about this. And I want to take you on a journey that took place in a small rice farming village in southern India called Chitlanjeri. And that's where I had this thought process. Now, Chitlanjeri is a very soft spot in my heart because it is my home village. And this is where my grandparents grew up as poor rice farmers. And this is where my parents, the pictures at the top, were also raised without access to electricity, running water, or any kind of technology. When I was young, and I would visit Chitlanjeri often, the entire village of 20,000 people had three telephones with two-digit numbers. Imagine the fight for vanity numbers in that village. <laughs> <laughs> so back then, I considered myself a child prodigy because I carried the entire phone book for a village of 20,000 people in my head. <laughs> and I still do, 31, 32, and 33. <laughs> Six months ago, I was back in the village with my parents and my siblings for a ceremony in the village temple. And as I was walking around these paddy fields, I noticed that most people in the village had access to a cell phone. And it struck me then that anybody in this village could pull out this little organ that has miraculously sprouted at the end of her fingertips, punch in 15 numbers, and be instantly having a conversation with any of you, or be able to share a slice of their life socially and through pictures and video with any of you. All of a sudden, we are at this stage where geography and location is not a barrier at all. Whether we live in a mega city or whether we live in a tiny rural community, six billion of us are interconnected. This is unprecedented in human history. But the question is, what are we doing with this capability? How are we building community? What kind of social good is coming about as a result of this level of interconnectedness between six billion human beings. And to showcase that, I'm going to share the stories of three communities around the world. The first community lives in Soy, Kenya. And I want to tell you the story of Zach Mater, who is a farmer in Soy, Kenya. And now, can we roll the video, Zach Mater, please? Not long ago, 
I planted a crop of potatoes. Then suddenly they started dying one after the other. Checked out the books and they didn't tell me much. So I went and I, I did the search. Potato diseases. One of the websites told me that ants could be the problem. It said sprinkle wood ash over the plants. Then after a few days, the ants disappeared. I got excited about it. I realized that not everybody can be able to access what I was able to access. I thought that I need to have an internet that my grandmother can use. And so I thought about a notice board, a simple wooden notice board. When I get information on my phone, I'm able to post the information on the When people have the knowledge, they can find solutions. So Zach Mater says when people have access to knowledge, they find solutions to their problems. But the genius of Zach is how he has taken a two-year-old technology and a 2,000-year-old technology called paper and put it together to help his community connect to knowledge that is available as part of our collective wisdom on the Internet. And the genius of Zach is that how he's able to tap into useful knowledge that is available in the world through the Internet, through his cell phone, and when he finds something useful, he makes it available to his community in Soy, Kenya, through what he calls an internet even my grandmother can use, a simple wooden notice board. That is the genius of Zach, and that's how this community is plugged into the global community. The second story I want to tell you about, I'm going to take you to Ontario, Canada, and Scotts Valley, California. What is happening around the world is these communities are beginning to form on social media based on what people are interested in. People who don't know each other are finding each other based on a shared interest and are able to form a community. And to talk about this particular community, I want to introduce you to somebody called John Butterell, who's on the left. He lives in Ontario, Canada. Now, John is a professional photographer. And as a professional photographer, one of the things that he organizes is photo walks. He picks a, a, a nature setting, goes on a walk, and other amateur photographers join him on this walk, and they take beautiful pictures and exchange information with each other about aperture settings, about lighting, about camera equipment, etc. If you're interested in photography, and to participate in a photo walk, you need three things. You need the right camera equipment, you need to be physically present in that location with the professional photographer, and you need to be able to walk. So one day, John had this idea. He thought, what if I connect my cell phone to my camera and plug it into social media? Because these days, social media has the capability for people to see each other through video. Products like Google Plus Hangouts, for example. <laughs> <laughs> and this way, he said, I can allow people from other parts of the world to join me in a virtual photo walk without having to be there. So he conducted a small experiment one day. And that was the day Corey Fisk joined the Hangout, and that's her picture on, uh, on your right. Corey Fisk lives in Scotts Valley, California, and she has an interest in photography. But she has one problem. The last time Corey Fisk walked was 10 years ago. She suffers from multiple sclerosis, and for 10 years, her life has been on that bed, looking out through the window of her house. And she jumped into a virtual photo walk with John Butterell. Let me ask John to narrate the rest of the story. Can we roll the John Butterell video, please? One day, I was out taking pictures, and I thought, how cool would it be to attach a phone to your camera and hang out with five, ten people? And they would see exactly what I was seeing through the viewfinder of my camera. <laughs> It was amazing. The next day, Corey Fisk came into the hangout. I love photography, and I have been living with the MS 10 years, and this is my world. There's nothing more to my world than that. I just said, tomorrow, I'll take you for a walk. I'm going to walk closer to that old tree over there. Down a little, okay. a little more, right there. Lovely. For a few brief minutes, she wasn't going to be in that bed she was going to experience her own momentary escape. See you later. She was on a virtual photo walk. The next day, we posted it. And photographers all over the world 
jumped on board. This is Utah Lake. Oh, yes, we have a deep turtle. Look at this. Oh, oh my goodness. Can you guys see what I'm seeing at the moment? Oh. <laughs> After that first photo walk, Corey Fisk said, for the first time in my life, I felt I was no longer trapped in my body on that bed. And as you could see in that video, photographers from all over the world jumped in, and this community started growing, and they started taking people like Corey Fisk and now many others in a similar situation on this incredible journey through Italy, Hawaii, Africa. That is the power of community forming around social media and creating social good. The third community I want to introduce you has a 2,006-year-old his history, spiritual and a philosophical community that has historically been confined to a small portion of the world. And to meet this community, let's go to Cape Town, South Africa, and Dharamsala, India. At Google, I work on the social media product, and one of the capabilities we built into the product is the ability for people to talk to each other face-to-face -face because that is an integral part of how human beings communicate with each other. Even if technology is available, we want to be able to meet face-to-face. -face. In September, I set an intention. How about if I use this capability to ask His Holiness the Dalai Lama to use social media to have a conversation with his good friend, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, and have a dialogue around peace and compassion, and allow other followers of the Dalai Lama's teachings to join the discussion or listen in on to this discussion. And sometimes when you write these kind of crazy intentions down on paper, the universe mystically aligns and things start manifesting. Because four days after I wrote this idea on paper, an international geopolitical furore erupted, and I had a call from somebody in South Africa, Jonathan Ratinoff. He called me at around 1.30 in the morning, and he said, Gopi, I know we haven't met. I'm so sorry to call you so late at night. But we just had a call from the Desmond Tutu Peace Center. Desmond Tutu's 80th birthday celebrations are coming up, and they've invited His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, to deliver a lecture on peace and compassion. <laughs> Unfortunately, the South Africa government has not granted him a visa. And we were wondering, they were wondering, and I was also wondering, is there some technology by which you might be able to address this situation. <laughs> and apparently the words that came out of my mouth, when I asked him how long do we have to do it, he said three days, three days to pull this off. And we had never actually even launched the technology at that point. So apparently the words that came out of my mouth were, well, Jonathan, around here, the impossible we do in a day or two, the miracles take a little longer, like three days. <laughs> so 60 hours after I got that call, the Dalai Lama sat in front of a computer in his living room in Dharamsala and used social media. Archbishop Desmond Tutu did the same thing at the University of Cape West in Cape Town, South Africa. And this is what the world witnessed and participated in. Can we roll the Dalai Lama video? <laughs> you... <laughs> I've already told them about you. I heard you. <laughs> And while it is a real pity that His Holiness cannot be here, we are so grateful for the world of technology that has come to us and that we can have this conversation. Now this I really very much enjoy. You see, although physically long distance, uh, but I can see your face. I just wanted to find out from you, why does the Chinese government fear you? Some Chinese officials describe me as a demon. I immediately respond, yes, I have a phone.
Do you know what is significant about that particular exchange that took place? The Dalai Lama is part of a 2,600-year-old tradition that started with Gautama Buddha. The previous 13 Dalai Lamas had almost never traveled outside Tibet, and the wisdom was pretty much held in that community in a landlocked society and country. And here was the 14 Dalai Lama able to take his wisdom and his message and able to share it with a global community using social media as the vehicle. Today, the Dalai Lama has 12 million followers on social media. The Sangha has gone global. So what I've done with these stories is actually taken you on a journey that took you to four different communities. The community in Chitlanjir in India, which all of a sudden finds itself connected through cell phone to six billion people. Zach Mater in Soy, Kenya, who's able to tap into the wisdom of the global community and bring it to a small rice farming community. A group of photographers who are forming a virtual community on Google+, Plus, or sorry, on social media, and allowing... on social media and, and, and allowing people trapped in difficult physical situations to journey out into the world and a 2,000-year-old tradition now finding a certain presence on social media. And even though they are now physically scattered, metaphysically, they find connection with each other through social media, the followers of the Dalai Lama's teachings. But what is most significant profound to me in all of these stories is a very simple truth. Human beings thrive and survive on community. It is communities that provide the platform, a fertile ground for creating social good. That is our essential humanity. That is what being human is all about. And we are now witnessing the next chapter in that evolution. What we are now doing is using the power of social media to create communities of a very different nature that is not possible before, and in that process, creating a vehicle for unleashing social good. So as you leave TEDx today and wander off, I want you to ponder about a couple of questions. And those questions are, how are, how, how are you going to use social media how are you going to build community? How are you going to create social good? How? Thank you. <laughs>